and what are the reasons for why we should be worried or at least cautious about how fast we proceed. Everyone's read about stem cells. It's impossible these days to not open a newspaper and read something about stem cells. So what I'm going to do is tell you where the word stem comes from. Pretty much most of you would have read the word stem somewhere in your textbooks and you would have thought about the stem of a tree, the stem of a plant. Well, that's where it derives from in a sense. And a stem is like that part of a structure that can give rise to everything. So it has the ability to generate everything. So that's pretty much what these stem cells are. They have the ability to generate all the different kinds of cells that make up parts of our body. And the most magical of stem cells, or I'm using a non-scientific word, and now this is a fun word because it's a stemist of stem cells. The stem cell that has claimed to be the most stem of all. Okay? The stemist of stem cells is the cell that's the egg cell that gave rise to all of us, the embryo, the fertilized embryo that generates all of us and every living being that comes from fertilization. So let's look at this particular being being generated. And we would have also been generated pretty much similarly, maybe not over a 24 hour stretch. We have to hang around there for nine months. This is a fish that's going to be out of its egg situation in, in a short period of time. And you can see you're at the four, st uh, four cell stage here. And this is a 24 hour movie compressed. You can see the ball of cells divides. This is how gastrulation should be taught rather than cartoons and drawings in textbook, which is what puts most people off biology, unfortunately. But this is what is actually happening with that 24 hour stretch. And you have an eye, you have a tail, okay? And if you want to see this again, and it's pretty magical because this is where the journey begins. You start the ball of cells, the cells is now going to, now that these cells have figured out who's going to make the front of the body, who's going to make the back of the body, who's going to become the spinal cord, who's going to become the eye. They all start at the same. So they have to then decide who they're going to become, where they're going to live, who their neighbors are going to be. Eventually they have to make this complex structure. This little fish is going to swim out in a second. Pigment cells come in, a little bit of black, the eyes are nice, breaks open the egg, and out it emerges. Okay? And from that little ball of cells, it generates, starting like this, can generate an organism like this. Okay, different colors, quite magical, and it generates all of us. So this has probably been something that biologists have been fascinated by. You have one ball of cells, and that generates all the diversity that you see every day. How do those cells know who to become? How do they retain this power and this ability to pretty much become everything? So there are other different kinds of stem cells. So even stem cells have a hierarchy. There are the stemist of stem cells, and those are the embryonic stem cells. They are the ones who can become everyone. Okay. But there are also little branches that come out that still have stem cell-like properties. So you can think of adult stem cells as the big branches. Not the main trunk of your building, you know, of your tree that can generate everything, but things that can generate pretty much quite a few things. So you could have adult stem cells, for example, in the bone marrow that generate everything associated with the hematopoietic lineage, blood lineage. Okay? You could have liver stem cells, you have stem cells in the eye, you have stem cells in the brain. They can't generate everything, but they can generate quite a bit. Who can they become? And this is why there's so much excitement. Okay? For the longest time, we knew this, this. We knew that the cell can become everything. But to be able to tap and harness, this was not something that was in, in the realm of real possibility for the last 30 or 40 years. And you can grow these cells. You can take them and put them in a dish and they will divide. Okay? They also raise and come with a lot of ethical questions and a substantial amount of responsibility, obviously. But you can see, if you put them in a cell, if you put these cells in a dish, they will divide, they will replicate, they need their growth factors, they need their food, but they will do things. And then if you leave them alone sometimes, they will spontaneously do very, very interesting things. Can you see what that, that bunch of cells is doing? Okay. So you have now got differentiation to cardiac myocytes, cells that form your heart. So this is this was fascinating for the first round of people who discovered these, these cells that were just little round cells dividing are now doing some very interesting things. They've started beating. And if you put, now you can do genetic engineering and put a little bit of you know, green fluorescent protein inside. It's not fluorescent green. It's just a cooler way of looking at it. But it's going to do the same thing. It's going to generate. And you can see it much more dramatically here. A nice, rhythmic, almost heartbeat-like state, but in a small little plate. What about in the brain? And that's, that's the system that I work with and I'm quite excited about. How about the adult brain? Does that have stem cells? Well, 
nobody believed it. For a hundred years, it was unacceptable to think that your adult brain, which you all are walking around with, which gives you your own identity, actually has small cells dividing in there that are, are stem cell like. Not this structure. The liver is, you know, okay. You can imagine the liver regenerating, but your nervous system, how can you even imagine this? So this was almost heresy to say that your brain has the ability to make new cells. But over the last 20 years, we've realized that the brain is actually, unfortunately or fortunately, not that different from your liver. It also has stem cells, and those stem cells can divide. And if you put them in the dish, and this is a rat brain that you can see on this side, okay, that's the front, that's the back, that's the cerebellum. If you take the rat brain, you can put them in a dish, and you'll get clusters and clusters of cells. And here you can see some cells which are green fluorescent protein labeled, and some that are not, which are dividing merrily away in a dish when they're given all the good food that they require to go through this process. But these cells are a little bit different from those myocytes that had to form the heart muscle. Things that give you brain function. Suppose I want to move my finger. Sure, a cell in my brain is commanding me to do that. But that cell has to connect all the way down to my spinal cord, which has to connect down to the peripheral nerves, which will allow me to do that. So the function of the brain can only happen if cells start talking to each other. And that's where you start wondering about, even if you can make cells like this, how do these cells know who to go and talk to? And look, here are cells, again, in addition to this case, sending out their arms and branches to find out who's the neighbor that they actually want to make contact with, who do they want to speak with. And that's a little growth pose, which is almost like a friendly handshake saying, are you going to be my partner and are we going to be in communication with each other? So how much repair is really <laughs> Unfortunately, pretty much down here. And you know, I, I was very happy to see Obama elected, but I was very sad to see Bush go because now I, I will only be able to show this slide for some more time and then I will have to replace him. And Obama certainly doesn't fit over there. So, but anyway, so if you vote to Bush, it is pretty much down here. Okay? If you are a new or a lizard, it's great news for you because your stem cells are working far better than the stem cells in us. How many of you have, by mistake, squashed the limb of a lizard or cut off its tail unintentionally and, you know, because you shut a door? How many of you? Lots of people, right? Someone or the other has somehow ended up doing this. And have you seen that poor, unfortunate lizard hopefully recover and come back with a limb and a tail and grow back? Well, that's unbelievable, right? I mean, if we were to cut off a limb, we have no scope of regrowing this limb back. What can we learn from this? these animals. So it's great news if you're a salamander or a newt or you're a lizard because your stem cells are very much like the stemmest of stem cells. They can do pretty much anything. They can go back your limbs. And if you look, here's an example from a Howard Hughes Medical Institute video of a cartoon of what would actually be happening in a newt, in this case a newt, when there was a limb that was sutured. Okay, slightly unpleasant, but it's only a cartoon for the moment, so let's just hang in there and see what happens. So, the limb gets cut, and then, man, the wound heals, and then cells that were actually not even there start de-differentiating. They take on stem cell-like properties, and they rush to the spot that has had this injury, and now they decide, I'm going to be forming the bone that I need to form out here. I'm going to form cartilage. I'm going to form muscle. Not only am I going to do that, I'm going to grow back this limb and I'm going to recreate what would have happened if this lizard was developing. I'm going to give it digits. Pretty miraculous, okay? That you start with this and you recreate the entire arm. Well, unfortunately, we're not. Unfortunately, we're not mutes and lizards. How much of our repair is going to be realistic? What if we were to cut off an appendage? Can we grow it back? I mean, is this even something that, is this science fiction or is this even the, you know, are we talking about absolutely possible things happening? Well, let's talk about the brain. It's good news if you're in the heart, it's great news if you're in the liver because, you know, that field will move much faster. Stem cells there don't have to work as hard to repair those circuits. They have to sit in one spot and they have to repair the wound. But in the brain, if you use neurons in your cortex that control your arm, these things have to fill those spots up, but then if sitting there is not going to be good enough. They have to talk to their partners. And that can be, in some cases, a distance of half a meter or so. And that's not a small distance for a cell to actually make its way through in a very, very complicated location. 